Health Institute's NIH Diversity Supplement Webinar, part two of our webinar series. My name is Sun Yu Cotter, and I am the Deputy Director of the UC Global Health Institute and also the Co-Chair of the UC Global Health Institute's Black Lives Matter Task Force. The Institute is part of the UC University of California Health Division at the UC Office of the President. Early this year, we realized that there are literally thousands of eligible parent grant grants across the UC system, while the number of successfully awarded diversity supplements remain in just the double digits. UC can do much better. Our efforts to spread the word about this underutilized resource complements the successful efforts of the SF Build and the UC Irvine Build programs. Our first webinar in the spring provided an overview of the NIH diversity supplement application process, and we had a panel with three program directors from NIH. For those of you who attended, you had lots of really great questions, so we added a hefty question and answer section on our website. I'll drop the link in the chat and encourage you all to check it out. Today, we have a panel moderated by our colleague from the NIH, who I will introduce to all of you shortly, and panelists from UC Irvine, UC Merced, and UC San Francisco to learn about their experiences with NIH diversity supplements. Oftentimes, there's a tendency for us to really focus on, on getting the funding, when in reality, it's really just the beginning of one's journey. And now, I am thrilled to introduce our colleague and my friend, Dr. Rob Rivers. He is a program director at the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases. For those of you who attended our last webinar in the spring, you'll recognize Rob as he was one of the panelists. And a fun factoid about Rob is that he adopted a pandemic pup named Chosky. And today he'll be moderating the panel and will introduce our stars of the webinar shortly. And then real quick, I wanted to encourage everyone to drop questions in the um, at any time using the Zoom question and answer function. And that portion of the webinar will be led by our UC Global Health Institute director, Dr. Tom Coates, along with Rob. So over to you, Rob. Thank you, Sun, for the introduction. And it's so great to be back with everyone. Um, the first event was so good. We were like, how can we keep this conversation going and really address what are the next steps? Because as Sun mentioned, we often think about applying to these opportunities and applying to diversity supplements. But really, in ensuring that we have a diverse biomedical workforce, it's what we do upon receipt of funding. And those training opportunities that then develop will really lead to a diversification of the workforce. So I'm really excited to, to have this conversation with three amazing panelists. And I'm not gonna steal their thunder, but I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves. So if Candace, Clarissa, and then John could introduce themselves and just a little bit about their interaction with the diversity supplement, and then we're gonna jump right into a, a more in-depth conversation. So I'm gonna pass the mic to Candace right now. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be able to participate in this panel and it's exciting to have the opportunity to just really rest in accomplishment of being able to get a diversity supplement. So um, thank you again. Um, I'm Candace Taylor Lucas and I'm an assistant clinical for our associate actually clinical professor <laughs> with UC Irvine. And I'm also a co-director for a program called Leadership Education to Advance Diversity for African Black and Caribbean communities and the UCI School of Medicine and an associate program director for our pediatric residency program with UC Irvine and Chalk Children's. And I received the diversity supplement as a physician researcher affiliated with the Pediatric Exercise and Genomics Research Center, so a long name, but PERC is an abbreviation, and had a joyful opportunity to really lean in on the mechanism that it offered as a, and it was a diversity supplement to UCI's ICTS, so to the Institute for Clinical and Translational Science. And I'll, I'll leave that, I guess, as a teaser, I suppose. <laughs> Thank you, Candice. Clarissa? Hi, yeah, I'm Clarissa Nobley. I'm Associate Professor at UC Merced. Um, I'm the Kamangar Family Chair in Biological Sciences. Um, and I also have a startup company called Biosynesis that um, I co-founded in the Bay Area. Um, my experience with diversity supplements is as the, um, parent, the PI on the Parent Award. Um, so I've had uh, diversity supplement trainees um, that have received the supplement in my lab. And I'm, I'm excited to share my experiences um, with you all about that. Thank you, Clarissa. And John. Hi there, I'm John Gonzalez. Um, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Ophthalmology and at the Proctor Foundation at UCSF. Uh, I'm an ophthalmologist, clinician scientist. Um, I had the opportunity of obtaining 
a diversity supplement back in 2014. And so that really helped jumpstart uh, my uh, career in terms of uh, later getting uh, a successful K award. Um, and I have also had the opportunity of helping and mentoring a current uh, diversity supplement grantee. So I'm sure the first thing people are trying to probably thinking to themselves, you know, you guys have crossed the bridge in a way. So what are the things you wish you knew before applying and working on this project and working on a diversity supplement that you know now on this side that our listeners would find value in? Um, I guess I can go first. <laughs> um, I think, well, I wish I had known that, you know, diversity supplements even existed when I was a trainee because I would totally have applied. I don't even know if they did. Maybe Rob knows back in the early 2000s if they existed or not. But, um, you know, I still hear faculty today who are not really familiar with um, the existence of diversity supplements. So I think, you know, this webinar is great um, in that it's bringing, you know, this awareness about this excellent and definitely underutilized um, opportunity to diversify our STEM workforce. Um, I think so, like before we applied, I wish I had known how important um, the mentorship and career development plan is for the diversity supplement. I think it's actually, um, the most important section <laughs> of the entire application. Um, and so for those of you who are, you know, working on these right now, I would say, you know, be sure to include a detailed um, timeline in your mentorship plan. Um, and also I wish I had known um, to really like tailor the mentorship plan to each student. So like, you know, having done a few of these now for my trainees, you really can't use like a, a boilerplate um, <laughs> you know, generic mentorship plan for every student. You know, the plan really has to be unique um, and I think really carefully tailored um, to, to, to the student, to the particular trainee and also the trainee's career goals. Um, so that's sort of, I think what I wish I had known. I also wish I had known to um, speak to the program officer because <laughs> I've done it now a few times, like, yeah. And they, they always have something like, something maybe unspoken about the review criteria in mind that, that needs to be included. Um, or just like, they're really transparent about what should be there. Um, and every time I speak to a program officer, I always learn something new and valuable. So um, so I think that's, those are the things I wish I had known. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Clarissa. I agree. We we work for the government. So as, you're, as taxpayers, we're here to answer your questions. So do reach out to us. Do others have some of those knowledge? Hey, I wish I knew. <laughs> I, I'm happy to piggyback on what you were just sharing, Clarissa, and that both just knowing that the diversity supplement is accessible and, and now having a greater appreciation of the fact that it's accessible for diverse trainees across from like as even high school and, and college all the way up. And I, I got it when I, as I was actually an assistant clinical professor and so I'm an associate clinical professor now, but being able to have the opportunity to access a mechanism that really protects your time as a faculty member to do research that you're passionate about is crucial. And I think in hindsight though, I think the biggest thing that I would share is don't expect to get it the first time. It is competitive <laughs> and it took, it took um, my mentors and I three times to, to actually get the award. The first time we, we're like, oh no, this is this is not a good idea. Maybe we need to approach it in a different way. And then the mechanism was new. It was something that I learned about from a colleague at another institution. And I introduced it to my mentors. So we were thinking, well, maybe we're approaching this in an incorrect way. Then I joined a K club. So I approached writing the diversity supplement as if it was a, a K, a, like a training grant and got embedded into some of the resources that existed at UCI. So with regard to just supporting grant writers and, and offering mentorship around that and getting that extra support was so crucial. So the second time that I applied, I applied with really an, a greater attention to the mentorship plan, greater attention to just refining my, my research question and my aims and an improved mentorship team and thought, yes, I'm gonna get this didn't get it. <laughs> so the only difference between the second and the third time though, was that we reached out. The first time we didn't reach out. The second time we reached out and asked for feedback and got a lot of feedback, really received an enormous amount of support and guidance. That shifted really the way I thought of myself even as a physician researcher. I was like, wow, 
they actually are looking at this like this is a meaningful question. They value the community engaged aspect that I had for my project, which was in partnership with the clinic that I worked in in Santa Ana or that I work in in Santa Ana and gaining their feedback was I think the, the tipping point. And it allowed us to make sure that we were really addressing what was expected for the diversity supplement. So I have to emphasize that reach out and thank you for, for reminding us of the fact that our taxpayer dollars do go to support this. So <laughs> that's extra validation. Definitely, John. Yeah, I, I um, agree with uh, Candice about um, kind of getting uh, as quickly as possible some insights into the structure. Um, so I, a similar situation, I was uh, able to get a diversity supplement back in 2014. I was uh, actually at that time a clinical instructor just fresh on the scene at UCSF. Uh, and so the, the diversity supplement was really, really helpful in allowing me to secure some time to focus on research which ultimately led to me uh, applying for a K successfully. Um, and so when I, I was telling the group earlier before the meeting formally started that I've been involved with helping uh, a medical student uh, between third and fourth year of med school uh, successfully get a diversity supplement, the way that I approached it this year uh, in terms of us helping him was using a format similar to like a K award. Um, and so I think in retrospect, if um, I um, wish I would have asked some other folks in my group about maybe just seeing if I could take a peek at their K um, or a successful UG1 and then kind of following a similar format, I think that would have helped only because when I, in preparation for today's meeting, looking at my 2014 application, there were uh, a lot, uh, it, it didn't have as nice of a structure um, as the, the current grant for the medical student had. And so, um, and I, 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 you know, it's nice to have, I think it's all nice for all of us to have structure or at least kind of look at previously uh, successfully uh, awarded grants. And so I, I wish I would have known that back then. It would have been maybe a little bit less stressful applying. I, I would, as a program officer, I would agree with all the sentiments and ideas I've heard. Number one, you pay taxes, so you're free to talk to us. And we're happy to provide the feedback because it's it's programmatic review as opposed to peer review. So we, we like to ensure that it's not a, a black box or four year transform in terms of what's happening when we review applications. And that comes to another question I had. You know, all three of you mentioned the importance of this mentoring plan. And though, you know, we read them on the review side, but it'd be great to hear, okay, it got funded. How well did you all stick to those plans? And also, what advice in ensuring that the best laid plans actually lead to individuals following their passion and doing great science? Like how moving from plan on paper to actually implementation in your own journeys? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I usually, and, and you know, the trainee, both, both of us pay a lot of attention, I think, to sticking to the mentorship plan. Um, you know, after we're funded and just, and it kind of holds us accountable, I think, for what we actually said we're going to do. And, and you know, we did think it out really carefully when we put together the plan. So I think oftentimes, you know, the research will change and we'll get, you know, as we get new results and things like that, like, like happens with any grant. But most of the time, at least in my experience, I think the mentorship plan kind of stays the same. And so I like that about the diversity supplements, because as a mentor, I mean, it's helped me grow as a mentor, I think, too, because, you know, I've had to be really careful thinking about how I'm going to advance and help the student advance in their career. And um, usually, even if the science changes, you know, that the mentorship plan is pretty well, you know, concrete and in, in place. So, um, so we like to, I, I personally, and, and my trainees like to stick to it, and it helps kind of guide us. I, um, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, for, from after um, we were able to, to get the supplement, actually, the, my mentor's uh, project was not following the expected path. And so actually, we had to pivot a little bit in terms of identifying uh, new questions to ask with, res uh, with respect to the, the, the change in the structure, of uh, which was a, a randomized controlled trial involving a lot of international sites. Um, and so we were able to actually kind of pivot really nicely and ask uh, new questions that still were meaningful, uh, that still were feasible um, in that uh, period of time. And so that was helpful for me because 
um, it, I think it kind of keeps us on our toes or uh, reminds us that we need to sometimes stay on our toes and be able to pivot sometimes and that the diversity supplement is really helpful in terms of supporting uh, you know, research activities. Um, and I think sometimes even in real life, even when I've discovered with my K award and in the resubmission process for UG1s, for example, that things always paid uh, or you know things change significantly, but that that's okay. I think you know it's, it's still if you're you know conducting meaningful research and you just appropriately um, reposition the questions, I think that that that's helpful to just kind of acknowledge that 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 can happen. And I um, I think I'll piggyback on the responses shared with a, another unique lens, and that I had my second son um, right after. I was awarded. And so I ended up really having to adjust the outline and and honestly reflecting also on the fact that when you get a grant, it doesn't account for maternity leave. <laughs> and so maybe that's something that we can think about broadly. Um, Rob, I'll share that with you. So maybe you can take that back along with other feedback. <laughs> but in general, one of the, the main things that I think I that I have to say is that it really outlined a key structure. So having the diversity supplement held my mentors and, and I accountable in a way where we really needed to look back and see where we were, where, how far we were behind, what we were working towards, who, um, and then also with regard to small details like is I or B going through and, and are you moving forward with the creation of that idea that you had? So for additional background, um, my project actually wasn't in line with the research questions of the ICTS because it's an Institute for Clinical and Translational Science. And my interests are, are really in early life activity and active play patterns and early childhood obesity prevention. And so embedding that as a diversity supplement was helpful in that it needed to be a distinct, I needed to have a distinct question that was separate from the parent grant. And so I had no challenges with having that be the case, but the challenge for me was creating a lab. I created a mobile play lab that was in a in our 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 family health center in Santa Ana. So navigating the community partnerships, um, explaining why having the lab in a community setting versus an academic setting is valuable. Going through all of that takes time, and losing some of that time in a beautiful way. I wouldn't wouldn't take back the time that I had to be with my my son in those early months because those are also crucial. But uh, holding myself accountable to that balance of just that personal the personal balance that I needed for myself in that moment and the expectations that were provided by the diversity supplement it helped me to see okay so where would I like to be right now where should I be striving towards and additionally having the supplement embedded in our institute for clinical and translational science how it had the additional accountability and built on my prior work as a successful recipient of an award, so of an NIH award. So I was able to lean in on the mechanisms that were provided to others in our institution who received a K award. The diversity supplement was viewed in an equal way at my institution. And I think that that was beautiful because it enabled me to participate in a broader community where I was acknowledged and seen as a physician researcher, where my questions, my thoughts, my the just the domains of science that I was interrogating, it, they were valued. And I would not have had that platform at that time without the diversity supplement. And it also enhanced my awareness of how difficult it is to get a K award. So congratulations to you, John, in, in that and, and continuing to, to be a mentor as well. And, um, but I'd say the additional value of it was that I was able to lean in on the outline within the mentorship plan to then also be a mentor myself. So in UCI, we have mission-based programs. We have a program in medical education for, for Latinx communities, and then also LEAD ABC, which is a long acronym that I shared at the beginning. But being able to, to lean in on that mechanism of trying to support the pipeline and being a mentor myself was another domain of accountability that I felt compelled to support as a recipient. And that was also valued um, by my mentors and, and through the plan.
Thank you for sharing, Candice. And that also that that raises another thought in me. What are some of the catalytic outcomes from supplements? Um, because it's often it's not just funding that one person, but how does funding a person in a lab lead to not only you know change in the lab or the individual, but ripple effects beyond? Yeah, I mean, I think so. Diverse supplements have really been wonderful uh, for my lab group as a whole. Um, and I think they've really helped us to create this really, you know, highly diverse group of researchers um, who bring unique talents and, of course, new perspectives to our overall research program um, and overall uh, goals. I think for me personally, like as an advisor, um, they've helped me, as I mentioned, in sort of developing my mentorship skills um, by kind of, I guess, you know, like Candace said, forcing me to be accountable for what we actually propose um, in the mentorship plan, again, more so than in the research plan because that often changes, right? Um, I think in addition, um, Diversity supplements have also um, allowed us to go in different directions too with the science um, and often kind of exciting directions. Of course, they still have to be within the scope of the parent award. Um, at least that's what I, like my program officer keeps telling me, make sure it's within the scope, right? But, um, but they were not necessarily like planned in the parent award, right? So that kind of is a nice offshoot too, that you can go in a little bit of a different direction with the research um, as well. Um, and I think, you know, for the individual trainees that have come out of my lab who've had diversity supplements, I know, I know they've made them feel really valued um, for their perspectives and also have given them confidence, right, in pursuing these long-term STEM career goals and even research topics that they might, might not have otherwise, you know, done. So I think, so most of my di um, diversity supplement trainees were um, graduate students. And so the current one right now, she's actually applying for, um, she's going to graduate in the next three weeks actually, and um, start applying for um, postdoc positions. So she's kind of excited about that. She's a first generation, um, first in her family to, to go to college and now also first in her family to, to get a PhD. So um, soon to be doctor. So we're pretty excited about that. I mean, I've also had um, trainees that have gone from the undergraduate um, level to then apply to graduate school um, using with the diversity award supporting them. So yeah, so I think it's, it's really nice to see that. I mean. I don't know, um, you know, what would have happened if they hadn't gone on a diversity supplement, but I think the diversity supplement really um, pushed them to pursue these um, goals. Yeah, I would agree with uh, Clarissa that the diversity supplement, um, when I obtained it, it allowed our group to ask additional questions. I have a strong interest in ophthalmic imaging, so that allowed us to add that additional component to the research plan for my PI. The grant also just allowed me, as I had mentioned, we had to, to pivot a little bit in terms of asking additional new questions, but it also allowed me time, a little bit of additional time to get involved in another project unrelated to the supplement, which ultimately later served as my project for my K. So, I mean, definitely there were opportunities provided by the diversity supplement in terms of just, again, allowing me to focus on research in a, in a significant way and uh, take advantage of additional time because it wasn't like 100% of the time that I was working on the, the supplement uh, project, but I was able to take advantage of any additional time uh, to work on other projects. Um, for the current uh, applicant that I that I mentor, who is a medical student, um, that has similarly allowed us to ask additional questions. Um, he is now involved in an imaging component of our group's projects. Again, things that sometimes there's a lot of data that often is collected, and there's a limited amount of time that the PIs have uh, and co-PIs have, and sometimes you know really good questions simply can't you, you can't even think of these questions because there are you know, the three specific aims that are really trying to be addressed, but there is a, often a, a wealth of information that is sort of hidden within a lot of projects, and there just simply isn't enough time for, for that to be investigated. And so, you know, we're able to, to utilize this medical student in that way. Um, he has a strong interest in ophthalmology. The, the, the grant itself is going to be kind of a, a feather in his cap as he applies, which, you know, the people of color are far and few between in ophthalmology. So this is kind of for us a really, really big deal. Um, yeah. I, I love that we're really resting in that and, and thinking about this catalytic piece um, and that 
in a similar way, so John, the whole, the, the visibility aspect, I think is so huge. And Clarissa, the opportunity too, that you mentioned to really kind of have your ideas uh, multiply. So you can have one focus on the parent side and then have additional touch points for the trainees that come through. And I have to say individually for myself, the primary catalytic piece literally is just it's the visibility aspect and the way that our institution and and I you know I keep talking about the ICTS, but I, I do think that they did a great job of really recognizing the award in a, in a way that that not only made me feel like, wow, this is amazing, like this is an amazing accomplishment, but it introduced to our institution, this is possible. You can use this mechanism. This is a resource that you can use. And at a time where it is critical for us to make sure that we're diversifying our questions, that we're really thinking broadly and making sure that we are considering the view, views that are not always considered that aren't always asked and, and bringing in diverse perspectives into ophthalmology, into pediatrics, into each of our, our broad fields is so necessary. And the visibility piece, I'd, I'd have to say, was the most catalytic aspect. And it did result in additional networking. So being able to be connected because the feedback that I received was that I needed to diversify my mentorship pool. Like the mentor piece, I think, is something that I, I will just continue to beat the drum on. <laughs> and that, that was such a crucial component of the, the application because the focus of the grant is a science. It is to grow us, but we can't grow without effective mentors. We can't grow without effective resources and we can't grow effectively without a comprehensive team that really is allowing us to have the reflection that's needed on when things are not happening as you expect them to be. Um, or when they're not happening in a way that you'd expect, expect them to move forward. So I'd, I'd have to, to lean on both of those. So catalytic through the mentorship expectation and catalytic through the visibility and networking opportunities. Thank you all for sharing. Like, I, I, and I like the imagery of resting in this because it's, if you could think about it, we're seeds and the institution has to be a fertile ground for diversity. And a diversity supplement's a bit of water for that catalytic energy. So you, if your institution has that fertile ground and some water comes, you know, folks can, can flourish and, and grow. I'm welcoming back to the stage, Director Tom Coates. Um, and we're going to be opening it up to questions from the audience. And I see there's some already. Um, but if you have questions, this is the time. Our panelists are there. As you can see, they're amazing and have a wealth of knowledge. And they're ready to take your questions. So hi, this is Tom Coates. I'm um, professor of medicine at UCLA and director of the University of California Global Health Institute. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'll help moderate the uh, Q&A session. So one of, the, one of the important questions, you all three of you mentioned the importance of examples, successful examples. And I know that the uh, CTSI at uh, Irvine and at UCSF I think they maintain libraries that can be accessed. I know we had, we do here at UCLA, but the question was, would you be comfortable in sharing your materials? I mean, no, it's yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would totally be actually people, you know, faculty at UC Merced ask me all the time. Um, and I'm always happy to, to share. They're actually making a repository at UC Merced too. It's, it hasn't, um, it's, it's in process, but, but yes. I would be happy to share. Yeah, definitely. Great, thank you. And I think what, one of the things we, thanks Candace, you need to get dropped. I think one of the things that we can do with the, from the UCGHI perspective is look around to see where these libraries might be maintained in the system and point people in those directions. But it definitely does help to see how people, I mean, part, part of grantsmanship is making a persuasive case and clarity is important. And you wanna really, in the first 10 seconds, give people the wow factor. And so how, how, did, how, did, that, how did that happen? You know, the, and I got a, 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 a oh, there is, oh, I can't, can't read it. Uh, let me get it back to it. Yes, there is a repository of successful applications at UCSF maintained by the Residence Develop, Research Development Office. So certainly if you're at the institution, but what we need to find out is if people from other, other branches within the University of California can access those as well. 
Um, one of the other issues that came up for all of you is uh, you need to you need to build on the parent grant, but you need to be different. And and I, this is I, there's no real right answer to this, but how did you find that balance? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's very hard, right? Because usually in terms of the science, at least there's a lot of different possibilities um, for whether, that the science can go in. And so I think, you know, depending on the trainee's interests, um, that's usually where we start um, talking about, you know, a new line of experimentation that's related to the topic of the parent grant. But in this case, you know, one of the parent grants I'm talking about right now is about biofilms, microbial communities. Um, and so genetic regulation of, of microbial communities, um, but then maybe taking it, offshooting it to, to study a different species than one we've been studying um, in the parent grant, but still related, right? So those, that's one, one idea, um, depending on the interest of the trainee. And so if the trainee is interested in a particular infectious disease, you know, we might pivot the organism a little bit or something like that. That's just one example. But I think that part is the easy part. Yeah. <laughs> you know, getting to offshoot the science is the is the fun and easy part for us. Yeah, for 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 me, for um, both the uh, diversity supplements for myself back in 2014 and then for the uh, applicant uh, that was that was granted an award uh, who's a medical student. So I was a, a, a clinical instructor. So new faculty uh, in 2014 when I got my diversity supplement and uh, I mentored a uh, medical student uh, just recently. Uh, in both cases, we asked uh, just to really kind of narrow down a really, really specific question relating to some of the secondary outcomes that had been suggested in the parent grant. So the, the parent grants uh, in both cases had a variety of secondary outcomes that were not part of the main specific aims that uh, had been suggested as, as other avenues to explore. And so we took a, a couple of those and really um, kind of asked really focused and narrow questions. Uh, when I was a new faculty, I had experience with ophthalmic imaging. So it was relatively easy for me to kind of identify some, some projects with the new applicant. He actually is a medical student, really interested in ophthalmology, has no experience in ophthalmology, but is, uh, has some prior experience in a lab, totally unrelated to anything related to the eye. But, uh, so but he has a good foundation kind of in just basic practices. Now we're kind of shifting over to uh, clinical, uh, more clinical research. And um, so I was able to help him identify some questions and kind of steer him in the right direction uh, in terms of, uh, basically I had to start providing him with some basic uh, fundamentals about imaging just because again he has no experience most people don't and then we were able to kind of develop some questions from that and I, um, thank you for for both of your responses I, I would love to say that it was easy to do the the branch off but it was a little bit of a challenge for me and that I so there were two in the applications that I submitted, the initial one that I, I was considering uh, with my mentor. So my primary mentor is Dr. Dan Cooper. And at the time he had two grants and one, he is a principal investigator for what seemed to be perfect for my research questions. Um, and that I was looking at active play and that he had a project that looked at early life and early life intervention and exercise intervention for premature infants. So it seems like that would be perfect and I'd be able to do an offshoot of that. But in communication with program officers, realized that it wasn't ideal because of the timeline left for the grant. And then also the focus that I had was for older children. And so both of those kind of conflicted. And then in switching to be under the ICTS, I was able to lean in on the mentorship expectations and the community engaged expectations of ICTS. So I, I really would recommend that uh, one, if you have a mentee, that you take the time to listen to what their interests are and then to step into a space where um, really what, what Rob, you were mentioning earlier, what is the fertile ground that's in your institution? So what resources do you have? What additional mentors do you have? Who is it that can embrace this mentee and support them as they're growing and thriving from the seed that they are? And then step back again, 
look at the research that if you're the mentor that you're a principal investigator over to see where that's most in line and communicate with the program officer. And it could be in different in different um, institutes, but consider don't anchor one project because you think that it works. If that would have been a major block, I think for me in getting an award, um, be open to communication and be willing to accept that your idea might not be the best idea. I think <laughs> that's a, another recommendation that I'd share. I just really want to re reinforce that Candace. Uh, all four of you have said communicate with the program officer and each institute and center that gives diversity supplements have slightly different things they're looking for. They're very different across the institutes. Deadlines are different, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Communicate, pick up the phone and call the program officer and really get that input. It's crucial. It's crucial for a whole NIH career. Uh, so but particularly at this point in time. So definitely. I, um, I totally agree, Tom. Like either call us, email us, don't text us because we don't want our phones blowing up, but let us know we're here for you. Before you ask the next question, I, there was a question from Annie Rowe that I, I kind of want to, I want to bring Annie Rowe's question to the table because she's like, I keep hearing this mentoring plan, you know? Can you talk a little more about this mentoring plan? How can we move beyond the standard activities like meeting, networking, et cetera? Do you suggest a mentoring team? Help me. I am struggling. You keep saying mentoring, but can you put some, can you put some meat on those bones? I'm speaking for Annie. I, I can jump in um, with that in that there. So one thing that I will say is there's an expectation at times where you feel like you need one really outstanding mentor. And that isn't always the case. I really do think that having a mentorship team is so valuable, especially when you're more junior. So I, Dr. Shlomit Radham Isaac is one of my mentors and the center that I'm in. And then Dr. Cooper is a mentor over the ICTS. Having them both sometimes go through concepts and thoughts is so helpful. <laughs> so meeting with multiple mentors in one time is crucial because you're not in this unidirectional conversation. You're able to bring in broad thoughts that really move, move really and support progress in a beautiful way. And in establishing the outline, you literally have to have a timeline with dates and expectations for meeting and often um, have the expectation that you have at least one hour in person. In the application, you need to say if you're meeting in person, if you're meeting oh. virtually, if you're meeting by phone, you have to be very specific in the nature of the way you're describing that. And if you have a mentor that's at another institution, then you need to say, are you meeting with them in person at conferences? And it has to be something that is realistic and achievable. In addition, having a separate team that maybe isn't even involved in the research that you're doing. They may have no idea about the science you're describing. They are completely external to your department or division. Getting input from individuals who are outside of your expertise basically removes blinders that you didn't know were there. And people can look at the question that you created and ask, why did you ask this? And it may be a simple ask, but it makes you step into, well, why did I ask this? And why am I looking at this? Why is it that this is this one research aim is so important and critical for, for this study? And it introduces really a lens that may come from the individual that's reviewing your grant, because it isn't guaranteed that the person that is deciding on whether or not you're awarded is a person that is within your field necessarily for the diversity supplement. Yeah, and just piggybacking off of what Candace said, and also what John said, you know, um, look at the K award um, mentorship plan, because actually those are really good examples for the diversity supplement. They have everything that you need for the diversity supplement. So if you follow a K award and include, you know, a timeline, I think then that's, then you're perfect. Um, and then just to add on to what Candace said too, I think, you know, 
the mentorship team, and we've done it both ways where I've been the only mentor and then we've had mentorship teams and it's worked you know, both ways. I think it depends on the student, right? Um, what they need and, and that kind of thing too. But you can certainly get one with just the main, you know, one mentor um, there, as long as that mentor fulfills the needs of what the student needs in their career, right? So I think it works um, both ways. There's definitely advantages to having a mentorship team, especially if you're an assistant professor submitting this as the, you know, this is a PI on the parent award because you're gonna get critiques that are going to be like, oh, well, you know, have, this person doesn't have enough trainees, right? So same thing as you would get in, in terms of F awards too. Right? You, you always get those critiques as an assistant professor, right? So mentorship team could be better if you're um, less, if you're more junior. Um, and then also another thing is don't just throw on a mentor, um, like as part of the team, if they're not really devoted to being on it, right? Because like the program officers can tell and, and then the reviewers can tell when that person is like totally removed from the science and removed from um, you know the career development of the student. So, yeah, I would agree with all of that. Um, and also, um, you know, it's not entirely. It it doesn't need to be so necessarily so difficult to you know craft a a mentor team that revolves around this one person. Um, definitely, of course, you know there needs to be uh, you know one or two primary mentors, but there are other components that maybe already. Uh, playing out within your group that you can take advantage of that actually count as real mentorship. And for example, we have a weekly lab meeting and uh, at that lab meeting, uh, people are presenting their projects. They're either starting a new project, working through some of the kinks, um, looking to get feedback from the group. And so part of the mentoring component for the medical student that was successful in getting their supplement was um, going to the lab meeting and also presenting their own project uh, at specific intervals of time during the lab meeting so they can get really constructive feedback as to, uh, regarding their project and so this is where you know Candace had mentioned that having a timeline is really really helpful um, and so if it's you know you know think about what is already happening within your group or in that organization there may be already uh, mentoring uh, uh, components that play already that, that you can take advantage of. I always like to think of mentoring plans as laying out very clearly what you know, what you need to know, and then how the mentor is going to contribute to that and how the activities you're going to do. It gets very concrete and very specific. And, uh, and it can be a whole variety of, 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 uh, of forums. Um, what effort is usually requested by the candidate in the diversity supplement? And for the two of you who are involved in clinical work, were you able to get the time you needed away from your clinical activities, which can be pretty consuming to, um, to do the research work? Yeah, I was, I was definitely, and it was, it was so, so helpful because uh, especially coming on as new faculty and didn't have uh, my own uh, funding yet, which is a significant component to how we function. Um, it was it was really, really instrumental in terms of uh, allowing me to get additional time to do research. I don't think that I would have been successful in getting my K award uh, if I hadn't had that time that was provided uh, for by the, the diversity supplement. I definitely agree. And um, I'd say that, so I am a general pediatrician. So as a general pediatrician in my, in my department or in my division, <clears throat> not many clinicians are doing research. And so being able to have funding enabled me to explain the type of academic general pediatrician that, that I identify myself as. So instead of just describing it, it put literally money and as a part of that description. <laughs> so I think it, it clarified um, at least that aspect of my, my professional identity. And the one thing I will say though uh, that I would recommend is that as, as faculty members, we come up for evaluation every two years and we get a promotion and so in budgeting i think that was the only challenge for me it was really just that i i was promoted during the the time frame of the grant so then that can have implications on your protected time during the the um, frame of your of you being within the grant and would recommend considering that if you're a faculty member um, if i if it's okay for me to just piggyback in a concrete way for the mentorship piece please that, and that this does overlap with the funding, the grant actually enabled me to say, I have to go to these conferences. Like I need to have protected time to attend conferences because they were part of my mentorship plan. 
And so I had mentors that were at external institutions. And in the grant, I said I would meet with those mentors at specific conferences. So being able to say that and have that approved through the grant, it wasn't just me saying, can I please go to this conference for my own professional and academic growth? It was me saying, as a part of this grant, I am supposed to go to these conferences. And that was another underlying, I'd say, catalytic um, component of the grant that supported networking and that enabled me to broaden my, my mentorship team. Thanks. I have a question here specifically for Clarissa. How involved were you in the writing of diversity supplements for your candidates? Mm, I, I would say very involved. Um, I mean, I think I, I work with them really closely, um, just in identifying what they're interested in doing. And then, you know, I mean, there, there is a lot of effort from the trainee side in terms of defining um, the, the shoot off of the research that they're interested in doing. And then I kind of provide feedback on it. it and so it's a process. And, and just like you write any grant, I think it goes through iterations. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm very involved. And of course, in the mentorship plan, um, we both sit down and kind of do it together because we all have to agree on, on what we're going to do. <laughs> so yeah, so I'm also really involved in, in that part too. So as a follow on question then, how much time should an applicant take to prepare in developing and writing a grant up by six months, a year, three years, four years? Um, I don't think it takes that long. I mean, I would say leave at least like give yourself about three months is usually what, what we do, two to three months, two months, probably the minimum, because there's a lot of, you know, a lot of writing and uh, depending on, on, you know, if you have the research idea ready to go um, and, and you have a kind of idea for the timeline. I mean, I think the timeline is really critical too, right? Because it's going to be really different for a high school student versus a postdoc, right? And you often don't have a lot of time. So if you're applying for a high school student, they're often going to just be doing research for like the summer or something in your lab. It's not very feasible to get a diversity supplement, I think, for like a high school student. It's actually really hard because the timing never really works out, especially if you have to resubmit it, right? So more likely, I feel like for us, we usually We've gotten undergraduate level, but but usually it's graduate students um, that get these, and then postdocs who we know are there longer term, right? And then it, it gives you time to resubmit um, if you don't get it the first time, which is typically how it is for us. <laughs> so, yeah. I have two questions for Rob. Um, one is, um, does the NIH financial or technical support extend, extend to One Health Laboratories and educational institutes outside of the U.S.? And the second, what effort is required by candidates or requested or required by the candidate in the diversity supplement? So the first question is a great question, but I will have to give back, come back to you with an answer. Um, typically for both the diversity supplements and reentry supplements that, that are in the frame of this conversation, they're geared specifically towards US permanent residents, US citizens. Um, so, if the institution's outside the US receiving NIH funding and this candidate is a US citizen, I, I'm, I'm guessing that'd be fine to apply for a diversity supplement. However, if the candidate is not a US citizen or a permanent resident and it's outside the US, then that would not, that individual would not be eligible for a diversity supplement. Now, a technical support or a, essentially an administrative supplement or a sup funding to support the development of a grant is a different funding mechanism and a different stream. Um, apart from what we're discussing today in the diversity supplements. The second question is a really great question in that, in that how much time is expected from a candidate on a diversity supplement? And that goes back to the point you made earlier, Tom, about each IC has slightly different um, requirements for their supplement applications. So at NIDDK, we have an expectation for physician scientists that they have a 75% in lab or in research um, expectation. While at NHLBI, as a, a partnering or brother or sister institute, they allow for 50% um, dedicated research time for physician scientists. The expectations for non-physician scientists is that they should be close to 100% unless they're a graduate student and they have to take some, do some coursework. Thank you, Rob. Um, another question, that anyone can field is um, what about uh, what about preliminary data? Uh, you know, certainly certain grant applications you need preliminary data, like an R01, and even with a K, it, it's helpful, um, but it's not necessary. But 
should the research plan have some preliminary data for supporting supplemental aims? Right, and does this change with the level? I think it totally depends on the level. Um, we've had applications where we haven't had any preliminary data and it's been totally fine. <laughs> um, and we've had applications that have had a little bit um, and, it's, and it's been fine too. So I don't think you need to have them. Um, as long as, you know, you have the parent award already, right? So you've kind of already provided that preliminary data that this work is, is feasible and should be feasible, right? So unless you're going in a very different direction where you need to really, um, you know, show evidence that it's going to be feasible, I think it's okay not to have preliminary data for this. And of course, yes, I think depending on the level too, high school students not going to have any preliminary data, right? Because they're usually going to be there just for a few months. An undergrad, same thing. A graduate student may or may not, and a postdoc may have some. So, but I think I think an important thing you said, Clarissa, is you know it goes in a very different direction. Well, that may not even be then qualified for diversity supplement. So it's really finding that sweet spot. I think so, and you have to kind of if you do go in a very different direction, you really have to justify clearly and explicitly how that still relates to the parent award, right? Yeah. And then it's kind of the program officers and the, you know, the reviewers, they can kind of decide if they think it fits or not. Um, and but that's also off. where it helps to talk about it ahead of time. Yes. This is where you should, this is when you should email and to get a sense of like, hey, is this in scope or out of scope? And it, from a, if to pull back the curtains and review a bit, essentially there's this expectation for a high school or undergraduate, it's going to be like specific aim one B. Right, We're, there's not this expectation that the, the high schooler is going to come in and say, "Hey, there's this data we need to look at in a totally different way." However, for the grad student and postdoc and higher, it's a bit more tangential and it's a bit more expectation that they're doing a heavier lift on the writing of what that plan should be. So, similar to what John and Candice have mentioned, it's like the baby K or the mini K is sort of what's guiding the the background. And so, we kind of advise when a PI reaches out us to de in a DK, we ask to get the postdoc on the call sooner as opposed to later. And they start taking some of the reins and, and developing it because that's part of the training. Rob, I have another question here for you. Uh, is DACA eligible for a diversity supplement or is it only available for US citizens? Unfortunately, it's only eligible for US citizens. Um, yeah, yeah. And Tom, if I, if I can just piggyback please. on um, what was just shared the point that you made, Rob, about the PI and the um, postdoc or, or junior faculty member being on the phone, um, that, that was really helpful and crucial. And it also, although um, for the project that I was doing was more community engaged, as I've mentioned, so I was able to really explain the established partnerships that I already had in existence um, and that we had institutionally um, in a way that offered more clarity. So it wasn't so much the data as much as the feasibility factor that we really needed to demonstrate that um, the project that we were proposing was feasible. So another, another question, and then I'll, uh, I'll turn it back to you, Rob, for, for closing up is, um, uh, there's a question here about what, what qualifies as diversity? Underrepresentation can vary from setting to setting. Individuals from racial or ethnic groups that can be demonstrated convincingly to be underrepresented by the grantee institution. Um, uh, uh, so uh, the question comes from somebody who belongs to a SWANA category, Southwest Asia. Yeah, North I think I'll, I can handle. I'll handle the rest of this question, Tom. Okay. So that that's an excellent question and my my advice to the candidate is talking with their institution because the NIH recognizes that diversity depends on the institution the institution is is giving the NIH information that suggests that individuals from these backgrounds are are underrepresented in their area and at their institution so it's a situation where the institution would say this candidate from this background is underrepresented in the scientists based off this data so it as were the National Institutes of Health, we work off data. So providing the data to show that underrepresentation would be the way to, to say yes, from a historic a, a group that's not listed within the language of the NIH diversity notice, how an individual can then make the argument with their institution 
of why they should be included as a uh, individual increasing the diversity of the biomedical research workforce. So the idea behind that is that it's as inclusive as possible, and we just ask for the institution to provide us the data and make the case. Um, and so I know we're down to the last four minutes. So each of you get one minute. What are your take home messages? Sorry, Todd, we're not gonna be able to ask the questions. It's a great question about mentorship and sponsors. And also Judith had a great question. Won't get to them, but I did wanna give each of our panelists one minute parting shots and then a last word from Sun and we'll call it a, a wrap up. So who wants to go first? I mean, I think we've covered everything <laughs> I kind of wanted to, to say. I think, you know, maybe the take home message um, for me is just that there are no two diversity supplements that are alike, right? Um, they're all very different and um, all each one is tailored to the specific student. So, um, so you can see, I mean, when you, when you look at the samples, if you get some samples, just keep in mind that there, you know, there's not going to be one tailored fit for one particular trainee. And so I think that would be my, <laughs> my, my take home. Awesome. Yeah, I would um, say that, you know, definitely apply. I mean, it, for, for me, it was really instrumental in providing me with the much needed time to in additional projects. In fact, my diversity supplement project ultimately was not the same project that I worked on for my K, but it allowed me time to get involved in other projects that ultimately served as the foundation for, for my K. And so, you know, I, I, it, it would, it's hard for me to imagine, you know, where, how things would have worked out had I not received the diversity supplement. Um, and um, one, I do, I just want to say thank you to each of you, I think, and, and, as a last moment and thank you to everyone in the space that took time to come to learn about diversity supplements as a takeaway message. I would definitely probably think about it in three different ways. One is definitely leaning into the catalytic potential of the diversity supplement. It's a short period of time that really allows for you to leverage the backing of the NIH to champion the mentee and the mentors as being supported by the NIH and acknowledging it in that way so that other physicians and other clinicians and scientists, um, our clinician scientists and scientists look at it as an opportunity that, that they can utilize to support the pipeline. And then the second is to really not be turned away <laughs> if you get declined. <laughs> Definitely utilize it as an opportunity to refine your question. And even if you are unable to get it, I would definitely say utilize it as an opportunity to really leverage the why and to engage with the program officers. And, um, and lastly, I honestly would just say to take the time to incorporate additional mentorship pipeline components with it in that in, create, in establishing a, a primary mentorship plan you also can support the mentee and being a mentor and serve as a sponsor. So I'd really say, look at the, the mentorship plan that's offered as a potential pipeline for supporting and diversifying our workforce and for enabling um, diverse perspectives in science for supporting that and establishing that foundation for your institution and creating networks that link your mentee or, or the scientist to other institutions. But um, yeah, thank you. Be persistent. <laughs> That's the other take home. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, so much. Uh, thank you, Rob, John, Candice, Clarissa, Tom. Um, thank you all so much. And thank you for everyone who attended. So we'll uh, go ahead and um, upload the recording on the UC Global Health Institute website. Um, check that out later today. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>